for the most part, the majority of people can be reached because these these issues impact more and more layers of the working class every day. So it's been really encouraging to like get these reactions. When when I started, I thought that there would be way more negative interactions than positive, but that's been completely the opposite uh, in my experience. This is the only party that is actively seeking to overthrow capitalism, not in another life, but in our lifetime. We understand that the working class needs more than just the objective failure of capitalism to actually overthrow it. It's going to take the subjective factor, the revolutionary party. We have to actually be the collective long-term memory of the lessons of the working class, the lessons of past revolutions. We have to link up the causes of the international working class to the struggles that we have around us. We have to point the way towards revolution. And that cannot be accomplished on our own. It has to be collectively, but not just in a a collection of atomized individuals across the country. We have to organize with the communists directly around us. And that is through the cell. But how do we actually recruit them? How do we build the cell? How do we put it together? Well, the first thing that you have to remember is that the objective condition of the decline of capitalism is creating a mood in society that is becoming revolutionary. This is the molecular process of revolution that Trotsky talked about. Polling showed that 20% of young people saw communism as their ideal economic system. You may have heard us say that before, but it is pretty remarkable that If we extrapolate that statistic, there's potentially tens of millions of people in America that have a favorable view of communism. To add to that with a more recent statistic, 70% of people that were polled said that the U.S. economic and political system needed major changes or needed to be completely torn down. Again, I'll repeat that. 70% of people are coming to the conclusion that the system in America does not work and it needs to be majorly changed or torn down. So what will happen to these people when the system refuses to change? And we know it will refuse to change. We can see that in the example of US imperialism in Palestine, seeing the genocide taking place and refusing to change their position on it in any meaningful way. If the United States stands with Israel, we will not ever fail to have their back. So what will happen to that 70% of people that say that the system needs major changes when they come to the conclusion that changes are no longer possible? Well, the feeling that it needs to be completely torn down will become the dominant feeling in society. But there, again, there's already people that are communists that are around us. So we can find these people. Those people are our friends. They're our family. They are our coworkers, acquaintances, classmates. You're going to actually hear in this episode from some of the recent recruits to our party. And the first person you're going to hear from is Kurt from New Jersey. And you've actually heard from Kurt before if you listen to this podcast because of his joint submission that he sent in. I believe the only path forward for humanity is a proletarian revolution. Capitalism is actively and indiscriminately destroying the planet. I have two small children and thinking about the world that they will inherit makes me weep. I want to be part of the solution to the sickness that grips the world, as I recognize no one can save us except for ourselves. Growing up in a working family, Kurt had seen his fair share of economic hardships, but also began to see a general problem with the system that we live in. I've just, I've, I've seen how both sides live, and it's always bothered me that, like, I can see people that are clearly working very hard 
and still have to live in absolute squalor. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's really nothing that they can do about it either because they're constantly playing catch up, right? They're either in debt or, you know, as soon as they get ahead, something comes up and and now they have an expense, like they have to repair their car or, you know, someone has to go to the doctor. Any little thing that is not, (laughs) you know, part of your daily bread, basically, anything extra after that seems to just completely knock people down. Kurt, like a lot of people, went searching for an organization that actually had the same conclusions that he did, that this system was fundamentally broken, but had a very hard time finding an organization that was seriously trying to organize against capitalism. Tried joining uh, the CPUSA, found out that they were absolutely fucking useless. They also took over a month to email me um, (laughs) just to get back on my request for membership. Um, I, I looked into like the PSL, um, didn't seem like much was going on there. Uh, there was a, another group that I was with the, the PLP, um, that I met at a March 2nd protest, uh, uh, in Washington square park for Palestine. Um, and I've been doing study groups with them, but it's all they really do is you know, we do Zoom study groups twice a month, and that's that's about. It. I've been to two of them. And, you know, that's it. There's there's not really a lot else going on with it. We meet people like Kurt all the time in our recruitment efforts. This just goes to show that it's not a lack of communists that is the problem. It's actually a vacuum for a party that can actually absorb all of the communist elements. Not just any party, but a serious professional party that is taking the task of overthrowing capitalism as serious as it needs to be taken. We can't take a frivolous attitude and let these communists slip through our fingers. We have to actually create a professional apparatus that can capture and merge with these communists that already exist. I've learned enough. I've seen enough. It's time to do something, and and that was what that was the motivating factor uh, for me. And the experience was good. The first phone call I got from a comrade, uh, John, it was a very good conversation. He asked some questions, um, and he also answered my questions uh, with ease, which made me that much more motivated to be involved. Uh, it, it definitely told me that the organization was serious, and this was exactly where I needed to be. That's coming from a comrade in Washington, D.C. named Juan. We haven't really had anything in Washington, D.C., but we do now because of efforts of people like Juan for, number one, reaching out. It's also because of the efforts of another comrade that's from Philadelphia named Nico, who on a spring break holiday actually took it upon himself to, instead of just taking a vacation, actually going out to Washington, D.C. and help build the cell. Yeah, so I used my spring break, my week off work, to head down to Washington, D.C. and to Baltimore to build a cell of the Revolutionary Communists of America. Um, I brought with me uh, 25 copies of our paper, five copies of our IDOM theoretical magazine, Um, a couple hundred leaflets and stickers and over the course of a week um, went to a large protest, um, went to three college campuses talking to students and workers there and a couple neighborhoods around DC. Um, Over that time, we made five new uh, recruits, you know, five new dues paying party building members. And yeah, handed out hundreds of leaflets, sold almost all of the papers and magazines. And yeah, really started building in a city that we never had before. Throughout this campaign that we've been on of just asking people, are you a communist? Is that some people are not ready to label themselves as a communist for one reason or another, but we still end up recruiting them because they can be convinced that the thoughts that they had, the beliefs that they do have, do align with what a communist thinks should happen 
in the world, the changes that they want to see and the method by which that they think that that change will come about. They come to realize, well, it turns out I am a communist or I actually agree with what the communists are saying, so I must be one. We've had plenty of examples of that. About 10 months ago, I was first introduced to the party by stickers that were posted around my college campus. They said, are you a communist on them? And honestly, at first I thought it was a joke. You know, we're taught that there's nothing else that will work but the capitalist system and that other systems such as socialism and communism are bad. However, at this point, like many others, I was sick and tired of this so-called best system and was willing to hear just about anyone else out. So when I saw the communists in person in front of me, I approached them with an open mind. I liked what they said and it only took a couple of weeks after that for me to get involved. Now I've been home for the break between semesters and my main focus has been on building the party in other areas of Texas. I've been primarily targeting my workplace and have been trying to raise the political level of consciousness within my coworkers. I've recently had some good conversations with people about the upcoming election, state of the country, and what our perspectives and solutions are on how to approach everything. And you may be listening to this and think, well, this is great that there are all these communists around me that I may be able to find, but I don't feel ready. I don't think that I can explain the ideas enough or to the degree of which I think it's necessary to start. And we just want to say that you don't have to wait until you're, you know, quote unquote, ready. What would that even mean to be ready? Our comrade from Washington, D.C. actually had something really great to say about this. You've already done the hard part. You've already reached certain conclusions. Um, you know, we can get you the theory, but you, you already understand, at least from a big picture perspective, that capitalism is the problem. We have plenty of resources for people to start today. One of those resources is the paper. There's a reason why we print the paper. It's not because we're trying to become newspaper salesmen. It's because a physical paper is, like Lenin said, not just a collective propagandist, a propaganda tool but also a collective organizer. When people see the paper, they understand it took a professional organization to produce this. The paper can be used to show we really are serious about what we're doing. And here it is right here. This is our work for the last month or in the month before us. Again, what is to be done? Probably the most well-known, but also most misunderstood document from Lenin it explains all of this, the need for not just a very strong centralized organization, but also a central organ for that organization. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm a member of the Revolutionary Communists of America, and I work at Keynes. Hello, my name is uh, Anthony. I'm a, a communist organizer of the RCA, and I also work at Raising Keynes. Tell the audience what is special about you two. What, is it that we're twins? No, we're building a cell. Oh. <laughs> you sure? <idiot. laughs> the, the start of building the cell, um, it really started in the, in the like, tail end of winter, tail end of, of December, where I like almost jokingly asked uh, one of my coworkers, like, hey, are you a communist? Um, because at that point I was like semi new, like three months in, uh, uh, a, a new recruit, uh, in my perspective. Um, and they actually answered yes. They answered proudly yes. Uh, in fact, they, they screamed in the kitchen, like, hell yeah, I'm a communist. Like, I'm a red blooded commie. And I was like, all right, I, that, like, there's, I can definitely work with this. Um, and luckily we were both like pushed out the door uh to go like run trash to the to the dumpster outside of the restaurant um and i just started explaining like what our party is like what cell meetings look like like how how like we develop our theoretical level like what's necessary for a revolution all like the the i guess like basic principles of of what you want someone to understand about the party um and they were actually brought on board um and i had two papers in my backpack um Two of the two of the socialist revolution issues, and they bought both that day. And I was like, "All right, like this is this is a person I can consistently talk to," um, and they're still in our periphery now. Um, so a few few months down the line, uh, me and my brother are consistently selling papers at this workplace, um, and like the the middle of spring, we realized like, "Hey, like these like five people all have all have the same issue of the communists. Why don't we just make a reading group?" Um, 
And so one of my shifts, I just started asking around where most of those people worked the same day. I was like, hey, like, do you want to read about this? Like, do you guys want to talk about this? Um, and I initially asked for just like confirmation. And then me and my brother went around the store a second time asking for like a day and a, and a time that would work. Um, and eventually that, that was a that was a Sunday. Um, and that that meeting that was like a week after um, it was very phenomenal. Like I'm I myself am surprised like how well it went. Um, we sort of like uh, pop can, pop, popcorn read the second issue. Uh, we just discussed it uh, article by article. Um, and I think the most remarkable one was um, an article written by one of our Denton comrades, how a coworker was worked to death. Um, and it was it was weird because it was the Walmart that's like not even a mile away from our restaurant. And so it, it, like everyone realized like how close the class struggle was. And I think that that is the point of the paper. Like that is that is the point of why we have these articles. That's why we have these reports. It's to, it's to show people like this is nothing alien to us. This is like what we're fighting for all the time. This is what we interact with all the time. The meeting was was phenomenal. And I think it, it, it only went well because of the content of the paper. I just wanted to add like a sort of like an elaboration on on like how it actually happened, like when it shifted basically. Prior to that, there, you know, it wasn't just randomly that a bunch of people had the paper. It was like, because every single day we were bringing the paper into the works, workplace, um, setting it out and it would get moved and we have to set it out again. Um, but it, it sort of inflated to a point when like, it, not a day went by for a while there that like a paper wasn't sold. Like it was like daily paper sales for a while. Um, and that evolved in, into this where we had maybe five or six people all with the same issue, um, all with the same availability, and they all wanted to meet and, and discuss it. The cell as it stands now, it's it's pretty it's a pretty casual thing. Like there isn't like a mandatory attendance or anything like that. And if people want to show up that you know aren't already in the reading group, it's sort of just open invitation to all of our coworkers. Like we've had random people just just drop in. Um, but going forward, I mean, it's just consistently reading the new issues and putting in like various other articles like um because we've already gone over the second issue and not everyone has the third issue we're just supplementing that with the pamphlet over the history of the black struggle and the social revolution and everyone's really excited for that the most recent paper has our program and our manifesto in it that is an extremely valuable tool to strike up a conversation with somebody the program and the manifesto give you a good general outlook for a range of issues that you can actually speak to whatever subject or problem somebody has you can speak on that what is our analysis of that why does this thing happen and what should be done about it and how will a communist party actually achieve that so the program and the manifesto are extremely valuable resources for this and we just actually published a convenient booklet with all of these things in it, including the manifesto for the Revolutionary Communist International. Marxist theory is the foundation of our organization. It's what makes up our program and our perspectives. And that takes the form of physical material like the paper, but not just the paper, but our booklets and our books, examples of these materials being used to recruit are embodied in two stories from one comrade in Chicago named Helena. I picked up, I think it was the identity politics um, pamphlet first. And I can't remember what I read after that. It was just like the intro packet, basically. I started reading it. I met up with some comrades in the branch. I attended a branch and then I bought um, the history of philosophy. Uh, which is really what sold me on the IMT as it, as it formerly was. Um, and I was like, wow, I have never encountered a group with this perspective before. Um, people who are actually mobilizing and organizing on a level that could have like a, a material change. Um, so I was really encouraged by that. And that's how I decided to join. And ever since then, the growth in Chicago has been, I mean, nothing short of remarkable. When I when I first joined, I think it was like maybe nine or 10 people, you know, just as one branch. And now we're about to divide into seven branches. 
Um, we have about 40 members in Chicago now, and I only see that number going up. We still have like tons of contacts coming in. Um, so it's been uh, a crazy like year and a half, but I have learned more and become like more optimistic. I cannot tell you what this has done for my mental health. Just having something worthwhile to put energy into um, with a, with an outcome that I can see happening on a scientific basis. The other story from Helena can actually be found in a previous episode of ours. Helena is the comrade that actually was reading In Defense of Lenin on the train and engaged in a conversation with somebody who was interested in the book just based off of the cover. And Helena was able to talk to this person about the ideas of Lenin and talk about the organization. These moments don't happen with Helena or the person on the train unless you have the physical media of the paper, the booklets, and the book. The lie that capitalism tells you about alienation and um the way that people are unapproachable. And it's like, people are not unapproachable. Like you don't have to be scared of other people. Other people are living, you know, if they're on the train, more likely than not, they are having like some element of the, of the same experience that, that you are. And if that connecting point is like, oh, the train is late again, like that's crazy. Got to get to work on time, you know, or whatever it is there, there's a way to connect to people. Um, and so, yeah, I think over time, I'm, I'm becoming more emboldened to be more uh, frontward facing with the communism, shall we say, because it, everyone has been so supportive. Like, obviously, there you might have an interaction with someone who's, um, you know, the more backwards in their ideology. But I will say for the most part, the majority of people can be reached um, because these these issues impact more and more layers of the working class every day. So, um, yeah, it's been really encouraging to, like, get these reactions. When when I started, I thought that there would be way more negative interactions than positive. But that's been completely the opposite uh, in my experience. We have to be bold in order to find other communists. It won't simply come down to wearing the hammer and sickle or talking about communism without saying the word communism. It's going to come down to having the material out and open and a willingness and an ability to talk about those ideas. Without that experience and without being prepared, we're not going to be able to recruit the best elements that exist out there in an atomized way as individuals. The only way to prepare yourself and equip yourself with experience and ability is by joining a party, becoming collectively educated through the cell and then going out into the world as an organized communist. There are certain people that would have never joined had we not made a lot of preparations in the past to become firm in Marxist theory and have a boldness in presenting our ideas. When somebody comes to us and says, I think that I'm interested to join, one person that comes to mind is somebody that's in my area, DFW. His name is Ian. Both my generation and my mom's generation, millennials, have lived through constant crisis, capitalism continuing to implode on itself, then be bailed out by the government. Um, then implode on itself, and then that cycle continuing. I think a really big radicalization point and a real reflection point for me was 2020, along with a lot of people. The fact that we had a complete buckling of the supply chains that were so overly complicated to cut down on the cost of production just blew my mind how this country lacked the ability to address a crisis that could have easily been avoided or at least minimized drastically. We had over a million people die in this country due to capitalism failing. And again, who were the people to bail out these corporations? The government. Why is that? Because the government doesn't represent the people. A majority of us in this country are living paycheck to paycheck. A majority of us in this country are just a couple paychecks away from, from being homeless on, on the streets. For a while before actually joining the RCA, I understood the importance of getting organized in some way. Um, I kind of got to the point of the world, I at least I felt the world was completely collapsing around me and all I did was complain about it. It, it got to the point where I needed to either 
find an organization or start getting organized. And starting off, the only thing that I was able to find was the DSA. The problem with the DSA is there are a lot of differing opinions and different sets of ideals that are so broad that basically nothing gets done. Um, I was in the DSA close to a year and every time that we would have meetings, it kind of just dissolved into a back and forth with no implementation. Um, and I got sick of the fact that a lot of members, um, uh, with, again, I don't think any fault of their own, were either supporters of capitalism, actively defending it, um, claiming that cap that this isn't the fault of capitalism, but a specific version of it. And it got to the point where I felt like I was in the same situation that I was before I started getting organized. And this organization had no basis. It had no way of moving the class movement uh, forward. Uh, from there, I ended up becoming a uh, CPUSA member and kind of the same thing. Um, there wasn't any general organi organization. Um, they had webinars, which I just kind of found insulting. And I got to the point where I was just sick of organizing. I thought that maybe organization is the problem. Understanding that capitalism is the problem is really only the first step. The other half of that is actually becoming a revolutionary communist. What does that actually entail? What is that demand that you do? And that really starts when you join the organization. Are you joining an organization that automatically puts you into the work as a revolutionary communist? Or are you going to be limited to organizational things that the party is enveloped in, like electoral politics? Or do you leave the members in webinars? Our approach is a lot different. We operate in the real world. That's why we have the real world newspaper. But many people like Ian are burned out by the way that the left has been for so many years. You can't really even speak of a left existing because it all kind of just exists online or within these circles. What we need to do is create these cells that have actually go out and seek roots into the working class. That's what Ian joined whenever he joined our party. He joined, went to a branch meeting, and went directly into working on the picket line, talking to workers, going to protests, intervening, talking about our politics, the need to have a revolutionary solution to Palestine and their liberation. These were the kinds of things that he was automatically put into as soon as he joined, instead of just discussing things or being put on an email list or in a webinar. Ultimately, both these organizations that Ian joined made him feel hopeless whenever he encountered a really distressing situation at work where returns were coming into the store and Ian was basically tasked the sole responsibility for solving that problem because the store was basically losing money. After helping to solve this problem of the returns in the stores, the way that Ian was rewarded was to be blamed by his boss for the whole problem in the first place. He pointed me out directly, lied about me to everybody in the shop, said that there, um, that this had come out of his pocket and verbatim said that this is a problem because he doesn't have money to buy a Mercedes for his wife. This was my radicalization point. This was a Friday, and I remember going home that day, opening my computer, being so frustrated, so mad that 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 not only had this happened, but I, I felt like nobody was doing anything to to solve the crisis of capitalism. And I actually saw the launch of um, um, the Revolutionary Communists of America. They had posted a YouTube video on their um, channel and I watched it and this was around maybe like 9, 10 o'clock and after watching that video I thought to myself, this is it. I don't know how to explain it but this is what I 
am looking for. Yes, at the time I considered myself a socialist, um, but I had a feeling that this organization, this party was different and I was thoroughly correct. Um, I remember that night writing a, a pretty long paragraph um, and then one of, uh, uh, one of our comrades, Patrick, calling me. Um, that conversation was insane. I remember it being, I think, 40 minutes to an hour. Um, the first thing that he said to me is, I usually don't call comrades after 10, but what you wrote, I just had to speak to you. And our conversation was was so good. Um, uh, the, the explanation of the importance of uh, a, a Vanguard party, um, of the... Um, uh, policies of Lenin and Trotsky, um, the importance of internationalism, all of it I was in agreement of and I was in support of. Maybe not knowing as much um, as I would have liked to, but that did not stop me into getting involved. And from there, I can say with a, without a shadow of a doubt that the Revolutionary Communists of America, the Revolutionary Communists International, are different from any other organization, any other party, because they are the only party that is actively putting a basis. They have a Marxist understanding and are applying that directly using dialectical materialism. That was the failure of a lot of these other organizations. They lacked that basis, and so they had no program. They had no implementation. It's important to 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 go out and organize with the working class but if there aren't any direct movements to 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 advance the class struggle to advance the class war and we're focusing on class collaborationism nothing will get done we are still in the exact same situation and the only party that has shown um with strikes that i've gone to talking uh to workers are um aggregates um, our meetings. This is the only party, the only revolutionary vanguard party that is actively seeking to overthrow capitalism, not in another life, but in our lifetime. People like Kurt, Helena, Juan, Nico, Ben, Anthony, and Ian, these people were all experiencing the same thing. They understood that capitalism was a problem and it needed to be overthrown, but they didn't know how to do that because they weren't aware that a party existed. And that's really the problem that we have to solve. That's the reason why from the minute that you become a member, you have to take ownership of the organization. You have to jump into recruiting people and letting them know this is a serious organization. We are active members. We're not just checking in or following an email list. We're meeting every single week to discuss what can we do as the communists for the rest of this week? What do we need to learn to prepare ourselves to be ready for when things pop off like the Palestine Solidarity Movement or another George Floyd movement? That's what we're doing in this organization. It's not for fun or to come together with people that agree with us, but actually struggling to becoming a very sharp and capable political force. That's the approach that you need to take when you're finding other communists. You don't have to be perfect in your knowledge. You just have to understand the necessity and the urgency at which we need to build this organization. And of course, we don't want to neglect the point that you should be learning. You should try to develop a political level to be more prepared to recruit people or win people over to the ideas. Sometimes the realizations um, are not nice. Sometimes they're not pretty. But in order for us to truly ag address the problem at its root cause, which again is capitalism, the only way that we understand not only that, but we are united as a class and that only through a united working class, a united proletariat, um, can we move forward past capitalism into socialism and eventually communism. We can have a better world for everyone. This was like the really big like eye opener because I always knew that there was the the division, the hate. I knew that there was a problem. I knew that 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 we were united, but I never understood what united us. And now I do. We can't just be comfortable not knowing how to answer questions. We can't just be comfortable saying, "Well, I got the basics down and I can usually connect with people with these ideas." 
you have to develop a deeper understanding. And actually, you may be a communist, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a Marxist yet. That's going to take education. It's going to take understanding the theory and and taking that seriously. That's also the importance of a cell. Learning is not something that can really happen as effectively on an individual basis. The learning that has to take place in an organization is a collective learning process. It's social learning that's really going to qualitatively change the numbers that we have in the party. What we're trying to do is actually apply the things that we're learning. So you're not going to be able to do that by yourself. You're going to have to do that with this group of people. Those discussions that you have in the branch are going to be one place in which that collective learning takes place, but it's also going to be reading groups, it's going to be public events, and it's also going to be the contact conversations that you have with people, the, the conversations that you have at the newspaper sale. When somebody asks you a question that you don't know the answer to, that is the objective situation telling you, you're going to have to raise your political level so that you can answer that question. That's the whole reason that, that we, we say start now so that you can understand what we need to learn and what to prioritize. That being said, we do have a fundamental reading list for education that tries to address as much as it can the basic questions that we're usually asked or the basic aspects of our perspectives. The link for that plan can be found in the description of this podcast. Once somebody agrees with the perspective and wants to join, they should join. Once somebody says they're a communist, they should be encouraged to join. They should be put into the work immediately. That's the other aspect of this that is really important. The people that join have to be integrated into the work of building the communist cell. We have to understand, again, learning doesn't happen just with conversations. It has to happen with the activity. Learning is a social process, but it's also a process that has to take place with the rest of our body, not just our brains. It has to happen in real life. Every single new person should immediately take ownership of the organization and building the cell into their own hands. That means tasking them with postering, tasking them with paper sales, going to a protest contingent, leading a discussion in the branch, going out and finding the communists around them, going out to their classrooms and speaking up in class, raising their hand, putting forward the communist perspective. It is up to us to put these tasks in front of these comrades so that they can actually learn. But also, we have a whole list of tasks that are needed in the cells. We're not just giving people busy work to figure out things for themselves and, and to solely develop themselves. We're also having to actually solve the material needs of the organization. And so there will be a list of tasks that are needed to be done. You may think, well, a new person may not be suited to this task. They have no experience, but that's precisely the best way to give them that experience. Lenin said this in 1905 in a letter to Bogdanov and Gusev. He says, we need young forces. I am for shooting on the spot anyone who presumes to say there are no people to be had. The people in Russia are legion. All we have to do is recruit young people more widely and boldly, more boldly and widely, and again, more widely and again more boldly, without fearing them. Lenin says, this is a time of war. The youth, the students, and still more so the young workers will decide the issue of the whole struggle. Get rid of all the old habits of immobility, of respect for rank, and so on. Form hundreds of circles from among the youth and encourage them to work at full blast. Enlarge the committee threefold by accepting young people into it. Set up half a dozen or a dozen subcommittees. Co-opt any and every honest, energetic person. Allow every subcommittee to write and publish leaflets without any red tape. There's no harm if they do make a mistake. We will gently correct them. We must, with desperate speed, unite all people with revolutionary initiative and set them to work. Do not fear their lack of training. Do not tremble at their inexperience and lack of development. In the first place, if you fail to organize them and spur them on to action, they will follow the Mensheviks and Gapons. 
and this very inexperience of theirs will cause five times more harm. In the second place, events themselves will teach them in our spirit. Events are already teaching everyone precisely in our spirit. He goes on to say, only you must be sure to organize, organize, and organize hundreds of circles, completely pushing into the background the customary, well-meant, committee hierarchic stupidities. This is a time of war. Either you create new, young, fresh, energetic battle organizations everywhere for revolutionary work of all varieties among all strata, or you will go under wearing the aureole of committee bureaucrats. Those are strong words from Lenin. He reiterates certain words to really make the point. It's not something that he does often in his writing is repeat a word over and over again, but he does it here to illustrate the turning point in which they were at in 1905. Obviously, we don't have the same conditions, but we find ourselves in a scenario that requires the same exact attitude. So don't be afraid to get into the work immediately and don't be afraid to recruit people with no experience and put them to work immediately. Only the taking ownership of the organization and responsibility of the work into their own hands will actually create communists. We're not creating a school of communism with a degree and a resume. That is not the kind of organization we're building. And so the method of trying to train people up and make sure that they have a certain skill level before they operate in the work is not called for. It's uncalled for. It's completely inappropriate for the wartime that we are in right now. The class war is calling on us to put people into the struggle and learn through experience. It, it, Trotsky says this later in a discussion with Fred Zeller from the SWP. He says, leave the maximum amount of initiative to the comrade responsible for the work. In case of mistakes, correct them by explaining amicably how they are prejudicial to the interests of the party. Only impose sanctions in the most serious of cases. The general rule must be to permit each to progress, to develop and improve he adds on in that point that you can't just organizationally make people do things. We have to also politically educate the comrades into why they're doing what they're doing. We're not trying to build an organization of obedient people. Lenin said if you did that, you'd have an organization of obedient fools and you don't want that. You want people that can politically think for themselves. So when Lenin talks about gently correcting them, it's, it's in the same vein as what Trotsky is saying here. We have to politically explain the necessity of the way we do our work. For more on how to create Marxists and how Marxists are formed, you should see our previous episode, How Marxists Are Formed, which talks precisely about how to educate ourselves and how to educate the comrades around us. But there's also a wealth of educational material that we have published that, again, will be below in the description. An unorganized communist is a contradiction in terms. That means that if we know that there is potentially tens of millions of people out there that agree with our perspective, then we have a big task in front of us. And it's not going to be easy, but we have to get started today. We were hoping with this podcast, we could give some advice based off of our experience building these cells so far. But the best way to learn is, as was explained earlier, by experience. So you have to get out there and try to recruit. And you're not going to be alone if you are a part of the party. We try our best to give people every resource they could possibly need to be set up for success. If you have a story about cell building that you'd like to share, a story about recruitment or a question about recruitment or cell building, definitely go to the link in the description to submit that to us. This is the way that we put together the paper and of course these podcasts, these contributions by all the comrades that you heard were sent in. A lot of this is general advice to just get you started. But for more detailed advice, there's also some articles that will be in the description. 
But the most important thing is to build with a sense of urgency because nobody will build this party but us. So go out there, find the other communists, get educated, organized, and prepare for the war that we have in front of us.